my God. That was something last night. And I am talking about Minnesota's defense against Denver. Timberwolves up 2-0, taking the first two road games in Denver. Altitude, altitude. Not a factor. I think the first 24 minutes of that game, too, considering everything, that it's at Denver, that it's against Jokic, that it's against this Denver team offensively. You know, we can get to some of their numbers here, but there's a standard that we expect with them. I think it's the best 24 minutes that I've seen on defense in a playoff game in a really long time. I'm not going to say ever, because clearly there's probably another 24 minutes that I've forgotten about. But it was special. It's so special, I'm going to watch it again. I just want to watch it again. Because it was a mentality. It was the physicality. It was just, we're going to take this from you. I never really feel this way about NBA games when the other team's up double digits. Just because, I mean, how many times do we have to watch all these games? Like, oh man, they were up 16 and now it's tied and my team blew the lead. It's like, dude, it's just, it's just what happens. At 33-20 in the second quarter, I was like, I think this game's over. It was the double team on Murray where he got the ball, was barely able to bring it up over half court, and it got trapped by McDaniel and Alexander Walker. John Krasinski, who writes for The Athletic, has covered the, uh, covered the Timberwolves for years, was a guest on the show. When they double teamed him, he said it looked like footage from National Geographic. And at that moment, I was like, are they, are they breaking them? Is this defense so insanely spectacular that they're breaking the Nuggets? I even joked last night, I tweeted it out, I was like, is Phoenix actually good? <laughs> second quarter, it continued to get worse. Denver finished 6-24 in the second. Murray finished the game 3-18. of He's, His shooting split so far in the playoffs are 38%, 29%. It might be the calf, but I don't know if it was the calf last night. He's got the two game winners, so you're kind of overlooking that this is a shooting split guy who uh, last year was, was incredible throughout the playoffs. Jokic, invisible for the most part, uh, which is rare. 59% against the Lakers. Jokic is split against the Timberwolves. Again, just two games, but 42% and 20%. 61-35 at the half. It's the largest lead in the playoffs for a road team against the defending champ since 1992. I was watching Denver's players just continue to be frustrated. And look, it doesn't matter. You're just going to get frustrated. Things aren't going your way. We all get frustrated. Uh, I'm not excusing it. I got sick of them complaining every time looking for calls because I don't know that the physicality was egregious that would say, oh, that was a missed call, that's a missed call, or that's a missed call. But you want to find missed calls, you can go ahead and find them. All right? You can look at things in slow motion and say, hey, there was contact there. But I don't think it was that. I really think it was because the Timberwolves were that special on defense. If you were to call a timeout for Denver and you were the coaches trying to turn these guys around, get their spirits up, you wonder if you'd say, hey, if you don't have the ball, you're going to be fine. So four of you should be terrific. Because when you're watching the Wolves swarm, I don't like comparing anything to that Ravens defense from over 20 years ago. I don't like ever comparing. That's how I am. I wouldn't say prideful. It wasn't like I was a Ravens fan or ever have been, but I am defensive of the status of what that team was. Like, I don't want anything to ever be compared to them because the best thing you could have said when you watched them every week, you were like, and again, I wasn't watching every Ravens game every time during that week, but during that run towards the end of the year, you're like, it feels like they have 13 guys on defense. This is insane. And when Reggie Miller was like, it looks like they have seven guys. That's what it felt like because when you caught the ball, there was someone else there. When you got it on a handoff and turned to cut, there was someone else there. When you got a screen up top or off to the side and you were like, okay, I'm going to have a clear angle for a quick pull up here. If I go right to the screen and pull up, the defender can't recover that quickly. Nope. Someone would be there. When you went up to reach for a rebound, it was never clean. There was always someone there. When you went to bring it up over half court, You had an escort, and then there was also a valet waiting for you if you even made it past half court cleanly. And when you stopped with the ball, you were dead. 
Now, Denver's offense, small sample, we're all aware. But were there numbers against the Lakers that tell us this Denver offense is not actually what we expect it to be? Going into last night's games, across the board, Denver was 8th in offense, 8th in defense, 7th in rebounding rate, 10th in true shooting percentage. Not great out of 16 teams, but it was only the five games in the first round plus the first game against Minnesota. The numbers are even worse now. I don't know if I'm quite there yet. Uh, I'm not ready for the Jokic sucks takes, which I thought may take a little bit longer, but no, they were fresh this morning. No Rudy Gobert last night. Does that mean guys like me historically who were on the other side of the argument saying, I just don't get the Rudy Gobert trade, and yet here they are, and him not playing last night. Does that mean I get to now? I can't do that. He just missed the game. But no, I'm, just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Uh, let's see what game three looks like. But you would have thought game one would be the wake-up call for the Nuggets going into game two, and game two was even worse. I don't know what's going on with these Denver first quarters, but the wake-up call may have happened in game two, and it may be too late. I picked Minnesota. It was a bit of a coin toss. I didn't want to pick against Denver, but I was like, I think I kind of have to. I think this this thing is real, even though it's young, and this isn't what's supposed to happen. But last night made me think I might not pick against Minnesota again. Like, I mean, in the playoffs. Let's go to New York, game one. We'll get to the refs, don't worry. Brunson, one-on-one against Nemhart. Not going to work. I know the Pacers mixed up a few things. They had foul trouble with Nemhart. They had foul trouble with Neesmith. And then TJ McConnell got out there and just put on a show and worked and worked and worked. So you can say they tried a bunch of different things, but I think there's just too many times. Brunson must be going, hey, no Ubre, no Batum, no, like, all this length is gone. Like, you guys are going to keep me isolated. I just felt like there were actually a lot, despite multiple defenders assigned to him, a lot of moments where it was Nemhart and just Nemhart. Now, you can watch that and say, hey, this is going to work against Brunson. Nothing seems like it's going to work against Brunson. He's the first player in NBA history with 40 plus points and five assists in four straight playoff games. Nothing's working against this guy. The only thing that worked at the very beginning of that Philly series that made me think like small guards, Heavy usage, playoff intensity, length, strategy, multiple games. It might slow him down. The shooting numbers weren't very good against Philadelphia. It hasn't mattered. It hasn't mattered. 44 minutes last night, a usage rate of 35, true shooting percentage of 67, which both would have been second in the NBA in the season. The usage only behind Luka's number for the season. I know I'm only talking about one game, but then when you combine that with his true shooting number that would be only behind Daniel Gafford from the regular season, where true shooting is usually littered with just a bunch of big guys that don't stretch the floor at all, and yet you're combining those two things together in a playoff game for somebody Brunson's size, this is fucking nuts. He's playing 44 minutes a game in the playoffs. He's taken 29 shot attempts in the playoffs in these seven games. I looked it up. Modern NBA, who has taken more shots per game than what Well, MJ, 31.7 attempts per game in 86, swept in the first round. McGrady, in 2001, took just under 31 shots from the floor a game. They lost in the first round. Westbrook was 30.4 shots per game in 2017. I was shocked it was that low. They lost in the first round. Iverson, the only one that's ever had success with this approach in the modern NBA, took 30 shots a game for the 2001 Sixers and made it to the finals. Although I just don't think that team was that good. And I think the East sucked. And then you have Brunson doing it. So he's the fifth guy on this list going back like 40 plus years. So I guess just one guy's going to do this. <laughs> and it's going to work. He had 21 points in the fourth quarter. Now, the Pacers did double him. 115 apiece. 40 seconds to go. They brought DiVincenzo's man over to him, and Brunson hit him pass, and DiVincenzo hits the shot. So you're like, all right, well, we doubled him. We doubled him, Rosillo. And then that happened. But here's my favorite thing about Brunson. 
I don't like ball stoppers. Not saying you wouldn't want one on your team if he's a really talented guy making multiple all star teams. I just don't understand people that don't move in the game of basketball. And Brunson is tasked with all of this scoring, and yet he still continues to move. Speaking of movement, I like the way the Pacers played. Look, looked how they played, how they looked last night. It must be weird for the Knicks to go, wait, these guys move the ball, as opposed to Philadelphia's approach of two dynamic isolation scores, but you kind of know where the ball is at all times, and you kind of know, like, all right, well, this is what they're going to do here, and this will be the assignment, and Maxi is either too fast or too powerful to slow it down, so it's not like they just, it was easier for them to defend, but I imagine there's a bit of a, after a couple of weeks of the, the Sixers for the Knicks, where you're like, oh, wait, like, these guys swing the ball a lot more. The Pacers' defense, which I don't like, and there were three heart layups in particular that I saw in last night's game. It's like, wait, what happened there? Like, he was just wide open. He went coast to coast on that one. There's going to be a couple of layups where somebody's just open. Against the Pacers, it's always going to be a concern for me. But the second unit, beyond the scoring, where they outscored the Knicks 46-3 to in bench points, I thought the second unit brought a lot of effort and a lot of energy where – You'd think this Knicks team would be easier to defend when it's a guy who might not be six feet at point guard running every single possession. It clearly isn't, but there was some effort stuff from that group collectively, the Jackson minutes off the bench, where I was like, wait, this is this could be, could this be the part of the series? Uh, and I wouldn't say it's not the thing that we weren't talking about ahead of time because the Knicks aren't playing anybody. They played three bench players last night. Really, they only played two because you got four minutes for my guy Precious. So 27 total bench minutes. In comparison, again, with the 46 points they got from the bench for the Pacers, they're going to play some guys. And moving forward, like I like the Pacers roster. I like Matherin coming back next year. Like There's some things I like about this right now. Now, when I look at the Knicks' minute allotment here, three of the top seven guys in the playoffs right now are Knicks. It's Josh Hart, who just continues to get offensive board after offensive board. It's Brunson, and then it's OG. So I may worry about what Josh Hart is going to look like in two years because I'm sure there's some Bulls fans thinking about Tibbs and what Joe Kim Noah looked like after the good stuff. And that might have been a Noah thing and not a Tibbs thing, but they're going for it. Maybe Tibbs is saying, hey, what do you want me to do? You want me to play more guys? You want me to play Brunson less? Like we're playing right now in the 2024 playoffs, and that's the goal. And that's what we're working towards. And, you know, we can worry about that stuff a little bit later. That's maybe why that anonymous player poll always votes Tibbs as the coach they would least want to play for. When, in fact, he may be looking at it going, hey, we have days off. These guys are younger. It's not that big of a deal. Now, again, I may not want to see what Hart looks like in a couple years. And that could also all be bullshit. Maybe Hart will look great in two years. And the minutes freak out that we went through for years, which I think we've kind of pivoted away from here, may not mean anything. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you for that one. But the bench advantage is going to be the Pacers because they play guys from the bench. Let's get to the foul and finish this up. 118-117. The Knicks looked like they turned it over on the first inbounds. It was off the defender's leg for the Pacers. So it's challenge, it's overturn. And then the Knicks can't get the ball in again. Brunson goes and throws it off uh, Halliburton, and then it actually hits Brunson back. So now the Pacers have the ball in a spot to take the lead and win this game and steal one game one. So Turner goes to set a screen for Halliburton. Halliburton's its own separate conversation now. Uh, the numbers have been bad after the All-Star break. We've covered all this stuff. we talked to All-NBA. You know, I was tracking Siakam a little bit more. I'll probably do a Halliburton tracking thing and kind of looking at it. Siakam was fine. And he's just going to have moments where it's like, wait, is he in the game? Is he not? You know, but with him, he's he was really good against OG, I thought, and some of the one-on-one stuff when he got him deep into the hoop. And if Siakam does his work early, he's a really tough guy to defend. Halliburton was bad. Halliburton did not have big, impactful moments towards the end of this game. I don't know if it's a lingering injury thing, the multiple theories out there. I don't know. But the problem for Pacers fans is we know what happens next. Turner sets the screen on DiVincenzo. DiVincenzo flops. Tyler Ford, who's one of my favorite officials in the NBA, calls the foul. They review it. Zach Zarba comes back and is like, look, Turner didn't give the opposing player a chance to get set against the screen. So if you want to go 
letter of the law that Turner was moving a little bit. Okay, fine. But like, what is this? Iowa, Yukon women's hoops here? Because Stan said it best. He said, quote, that was shocking as soon as the foul on the screen was called. He said, never. And that's the truth. You could call kind of moving screens on all this stuff. But in that moment, that call is not made. I was shocked it was made, but then it went, it went to the review. You knew how the explanation was going to play out. I don't know what the last two-minute report is going to say. I don't care. I don't, I've never gotten a last two-minute report been like, awesome. Can't wait to dig in. Let me do this before I eat. I don't care about those. And honestly, I think it's silly that they do it, but the NBA does it for transparency. And then when they do it, everybody gets mad that they do it. So the NBA can't really win on this one. So I'm sorry, Pacers. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I can't believe they made that call. And that leads into everything else and some of the stuff that Bill and I were talking about on Sunday's pod, right? Where Bill was like, well, Pacers got to get it in six because they won't get it in seven in MSG. I'm like, all right. Yep. And I understand. And I, I don't want to be completely naive about this, but I don't think anybody ever keeps track of all the times that people propose something is going to happen and that something's rigged. And then that outcome doesn't happen. And then just, just ignore it. Whereas you have something last night and like, well, it's Pacers, it's Knicks. What do you expect? Well, the series didn't need to be extended. I'm pretty sure they're going to play another one in this one. I think it was just one game so far between the Knicks and Pacers and the Pacers historically over the last couple of years. If you look at some of the free throw differential for them, consider, considering how they play and then how bad they are defensively, they're at a massive disadvantage on the three uh, free throw disparity thing. So the free throw disparity thing likely will be a problem in this series for them based on how they play. Kind of like the Warriors. And, well, I don't know if anything will be bad as the Warriors and Lakers last year, but you get my point. Now, the Brunson fouls that he gets, I hate him. I hate the bad ones that he gets. I can appreciate who he is as a player. And as I also ran it, I said, you know, I, I'm all for the Brunson critique on the play. Because, like, think about the the whole conspiracy part of this. When Scott Foster was assigned to game six for Philadelphia and New York, Foster, a.k.a. the extender, that's his nickname, on NBA Twitter, uh, you're like, well, that's because they were going to want a game seven on MSG. Ratings, dollars, you know, it's the money, Russillo. College football, dude, it's about the money. Thank you. I wasn't able to figure that out yet. Um, Brunson got one of the worst calls of the entire playoffs in the biggest moment from that crew in game six against Philadelphia. At 109, 108, 53 seconds left. Brunson gets the N1, the Trey Younging it into Ubre. He missed the free throw. So if the fix was in for the game seven, why do they make that call then? And that's simply what I will present. Stuff like that all of the time. Theories, everybody wringing their hands, and then something happens that spits in the face of the consensus agreement. And so I hate last night's call. I hate it. I don't think it was because it was the chance for the Knicks to win that it was made. 